So in this part uh, of the last module, we're gonna be talking about polymers. And polymers are basically like big molecules um, made of repetitive units. So we can think about it something like this, making it basically like a chain. And the whole thing will be a polymer. And every circle is like the repetitive unit. And we call this a monomer. So basically you take a bunch of monomers and you keep combining them all together and you form a polymer. That's basically what a polymer is. And this makes gigantic compounds. And, and there's some like uses in like biology and there's some uses like in synthetic chemistry. So you have bio. Yeah, biological uses and we have like, when I write synthetic uses. Um, in terms of biology, um, proteins, are uh, polymers that are made of amino acids. Um, sugars. Um, we are gonna write polysaccharides. That's spelled wrong. Um, are made of monosaccharides. We also have nucleic acids are made of uh, nucleotides. And the last family that we so much consider biopolymers or polymers are fats. I'm gonna keep fats like that. I'm gonna tell you the name of the monomer because there are different types of fats and different types of fat have different monomers. So it's gonna just leave it as a fats category. Um, synthetic uses like, I just gonna put something like Teflon, PVC and so on. There are different types of polymers that we actually made and we use in our daily basis. So most like, I'm gonna write plastics are going to be polymers. Um, for the synthetic polymers, we will spend a little bit of time later. Um, there is a table that tells you which ones you actually need to know. So I'll show you that later. Um, but in terms of chemistry, so there are two, main types of polymers. And this means like whether they are organic or like whether they are biological or they're synthetic, like there are two main types of polymers. There are two different ways, right? This like two ways to make polymers. The first type, the first way that we make polymers is um, by addition reactions. And uh, we call them addition polymers. If you remember from organic chemistry, an addition reaction is where you have something like a double bond and you combine that with maybe hydrochloric acid as an example. And then the H goes to one end and the Cl goes to another end. So you might end up having something like this. And you ended up having an addition reaction. 
Um, so this is, I want to write addition reaction. in orga. So for polymers, the reaction that we use is actually really similar to this. So let's say I take this compound, same compound I was using before. So something to keep in mind is that when you're doing addition reactions or, or you're going to like an addition polymer reaction, you always start with a compound that has at least a double bond. So you need a double bond or you need a triple bond. You need multiple bonds like that so you can actually undergo in an addition reaction. So part of being or having an addition reaction is that you need to have a double bond or a triple bond. So you get this compound and instead of mixing it with HCl, I'm actually gonna mix it with self. When you have these two compounds together, just in a container, nothing will happen. But if you put heat, or light, like strong light, so UV light or something like that, you might actually make this reaction happen or the polymer polymerization reaction happen. And what it's going to do is this one line, which we know are two electrons, they're actually going to do something like, to me, seems like a domino reaction. You know, when you have two dominoes and then like the one domino hits the domino and then keeps hitting forward. So that idea is going to happen. This, think about this line, is just going to go and hit this carbon. And then this line is just going to move away. So I'm going to change the color of this line so we can keep track of it. And let's just do this one green. So we have these two compounds, this one. I'm going to put the second one below. And let's say my first line, when I move, so from here, form a bond here. So move and form a bond here. And then my second line now is hanging to go somewhere. And you can see how this second line could potentially hit another compound and then form a third line and so on. And this reaction will keep going and going and going and going, and you can make these gigantic molecules. So this one compound is what we will call the monomer. And it will be repeated over and over and over and over and over. If you learn about polymerization reactions, then you can add something later and you don't need to know about any of this, but you could add something later and that will stop the reaction. So you can stop it whenever you want, but that's sort of how you make these polymeric reactions. You basically take this container with one molecule and you put it under light or under heat, and that double bond would keep like kicking a next double bond and the, double, the next double bond would kick another double bond and keep making this reaction over and over and over, and that's what we call polymerization. So the first reaction we know about polymerization is the addition polymers and addition polymers just start with a double bond and that double bond keep pushing like a domino. Good. And for the most part, this is all you need to know about the polymerization react. Sorry, about the addition reactions. Something I want to add um, is a few examples, and these are all synthetic. And in general, addition reactions happen in the lab. These are reactions that we do in the lab. They're normally not happening in nature. Most uh, polymers that we see in nature are not addition polymers. They are the second category that we'll talk later. But this main category is what we use mostly in the lab. And these are some examples of some of the different um, addition polymers that you should know. Um, the first one is Teflon. Um, the second one is polyethylene. Then we have polypropylene. Then here we have PVC or poly polyvinyl chloride. This is polyesterine. I don't know if you guys like know how these things are used, but Teflon is well known for like use in like the kitchen stuff. 
like you got different pans and things like that. Um, polypropylene is a plastic. Um, PVC is what we use for like piping at home. So that's only like, you, hopefully you guys know. Polyesterine is what we use for packing. So these like fluffy things. And what I want to like get you to understand is, so if you look at all of them, they're basically like a carbon combined with a carbon. And they all start with a double bond. You see, they all have double bonds. And for the most part, they look really similar. You have some fluorines, you have some hydrogens. This one has a methyl here. This one has a chlorine here. This one has a benzene ring here. So the way you make these compounds are, is really similar. You just have a compound with a double bond. And then they have some sort of like group size sticking out. The bigger the group, like this one, which is a benzene, is super big compared to like just hydrogens. The bigger it is, it makes the polymer more like squishy. So like the last one, the polyesterine is what we use for plastic because it's really squishy, like for packing, which is really squishy. So it gives you like air. So it's like bendy. Um, the other ones that are a bit more tight, they make a little bit thicker polymers. So basically when you're making polymers, you start changing the groups that are sticking around the double bond and you will give the you will change the characteristics of that polymer. Um, so these are all the polymers that you need to know um, in terms of like addition reactions. So these are the addition polymers that you need to know. Uh, you need to know the name, actually the common name and the chemical name. And you still don't need to know what they're used for. Um, you also need to know the structures. I will make sure to also write the structures like condensed formula. So this one will be like a CA, sorry, CF2, CF2. So you had them all um, when you're taking the quest because there, there will be questions about like what monomer makes Teflon or what monomer makes PVC. For the most part, um, if you know a little bit of organic chemistry, since most of these questions are um, multiple choice, you can sort of guess as an example, um, let's say you're working with PVC is polyvinyl chloride. So vinyl chloride, you need to have a chloride. So out of all these compounds, if you look at this, there's fluorines, there is hydrogens, here has a methyl, this has a chlorine, this has a benzene. So if you need to guess which one is polyvinyl chloride is the one that has chloride. If you look on this other side, there is this other one that has chloride, but it's basically PV, it's actually PVC. These two tables are two different tables from two different chapters. And some of the uh, polymers are repeated. Um, PVC is already repeated here. Polyesterine is already repeated. So these two are repeated. The polyacrylon natrile, this compound with the natrile is not in the first table. This is what we use for diapers. This is all the things here, but it's used par partially for diapers. This, this one, polybutadine, um, is also new. And polyethylene is actually repeated because it's here. So out of the second table, there's only two more polymers that you need to know. Uh, what I was saying before is like, you should be able to sort of guess what they are. And for the most part, some of them are difficult, but like, Let's say polybutadiene, poly, which means many. This here says buta, which means four carbons. And diene, we were joking about this at the beginning of today, <laughs> which means two double bonds. So you need a compound that has four carbons and two double bonds. So that'll be the monomer to make polybutadiene. So based on your organic knowledge of what you learned from the last chapter, you should be able to guess how the structure looks like for most of the poly polymers. Something else that you will see is that sometimes I give you problems where I might give you something like this.
and just make those squiggle lines, meaning like the reaction keeps going. I could also like put R. But then I can ask you what is the monomer for this polymer. So if you need to identify the monomer for the polymer, what you have to do is you need to figure out what is the repeating unit. So I know the benzene ring, this benzene ring here is repeating. So I know that is repeating. <coughs> and then I know that this has to be repeating because they're all connected. Um, then maybe the line before, and you could guess the line after, and that will also be fine will be what's repeating. So if you look at that, then this is all everything that is always being repeated. As I said, you could have picked these other lines instead and that would have still be the same. So we know that this will be the reaction, that will be what, sorry, this will be my monomer. So my monomer to start this reaction will be something like this. And then I know I need to create this bond somehow, and I know that bond comes from a double bond in the initial reaction. So this will be the monomer for that polymer. And if you would have said this, using this line instead of that line as your monomer, that will also be fine. They, they both will give you the same reaction. As we know, if you look at these two compounds, they're the same compound. There are no isomers or nothing. They're literally the same compound. So either way would be fine. So it's an example of something else I could ask you. I could just give you a polymer and then ask you what the monomer is. Um, other times just give you the name and ask you what monomer makes that type of polymer. So addition reactions or addition polymers, as we talk about, they basically you start with a double bond in a really small molecule and then double bond just keep reacting with other double bonds forming a big molecule. Um, the second type of polymer are condensation polymers. And condensation polymers are reactions that release water molecules. And this is how most biological polymers are made. Um, so I'm gonna show you gonna pick a non-biological polymer. Um, I'm gonna talk about polyester. Hopefully we know what polyester is used for. Like we know like we use cotton and polyester as our major fabrics for most of the clothing we use. Um, so polyester, now that we know organic chemistry, we can actually understand what this is. So polyester means many esters. And what are esters? Esters are a carbon double bonded with oxygen, single bonded to oxygen, and continuum. That is a polyester. Um, I'm actually gonna go and look at a polyester, how it actually looks like, because when the one I'm gonna draw is not a real polyester. So if I look at polyester, that's what I get. So. I get a bunch of different fabrics because we know what that's polyester used for. If I go to polyester chemical structure, we will see different ones, but there are different types of polyester. But as you can see, they give you an ester formation and they say the N, which means that this is your monomer and it keeps multiplying over and over and over. So. You can make polyester in different ways. And if you see, you can make it with this random thing or this thing, which if we, co if we combine this and that, we actually get this. And we can do this as, as an example for the class. Um, but looking at all the different polyesters, they all have the carbon double bonded to oxygen, single bonded to oxygen. That's your ester formation. You see, they show you the ester formation, many of them. The N just means many. 
So this is the formula of polyester. Um, actually, most of them look really similar. <coughs> I'm actually surprised. There's some other ones that look more clunky. This one has like a metal sticking out. This one looks like now they don't have the benzene, they have something else. So polyester can have different forms, but let's just pick the most common form. So the most common form we saw was a benzene ring with two carboxylic acids combined with a molecule that had two carbons and two alcohols. So this is the molecule they give you. They give you two different things. So how do you combine these two things? The first one, the addition polymers, was just all about um, bending the bond, like pushing one bond into another and just doing this domino reaction. This one, I'm going to do two things. I'm going to first give you something really ugly that explains how the reaction happens. And then I'm just going to remove that and just give you something really simple so you understand, like, really, really basic how things work. That way you don't have to worry about understanding all of this. Anyways, so basically what happens is like the oxygen has lone pairs and this carbon oxygen bond right here, the oxygen is more electronegative. So it pulls the electrons away from this carbon. So this carbon is partially positive. So the electrons from the oxygen come here and push these electrons up. So then you end up having something The electrons are up. We have the OH. And then we have this OH, which is this guy here. <laughs> this then happens something sort of weird, which is like these electrons come down but then this oxygen takes an H. So the oxy, the OH takes that H away, which means that you form H2O. And that H2O, let's actually change the color of this. So let's make it green. This OH and this H combine to form H2O, which leaves you with that. Good. So that's the whole idea. Um, sometimes what I tell people is like, you can make like this OH, take this H and form water. And then you connect that O to that carbon. So then you can go sideways and be like, okay, so now at the end, this is what I have. You don't have to do the arrow pushing or showing where electrons go. I'm just trying to explain how the reaction actually happens and where the water actually comes from. So these compounds, this is how they're formed. And as you can see, you have an OH here that could potentially react with another molecule that has the carboxylic acid and form another bond here. And then this um, OH from the carboxylic acid could react with another alcohol here <coughs> and form the water and so on. And then this molecule will keep building over and over and over and becoming gigantic. This so is the same idea. This is a little bit more complicated for addition reactions. Um, you just had the double bond, just put heat and you just keep polymerizing and making really, really big molecules. Um, for these other molecules, 
they're a little bit more complex the way they're formed and they're actually formed with water. There are good things and bad things about them. So the addition polymers, since at the end, you lose the double bond and you just have a bunch of single bonds, that makes those polymers really hard to break down, which is good because they're stable, which is bad because then we have all this plastic and we can't really do a lot with them because it's really hard to de destroy. Like even when you burn them, you don't quite burn them out all the way. So it's really bad in that sense. Um, these polymers, um, the condensation polymers, they are not as sturdy, like they don't last as long um, because, because they can be break, broken down, which is good because they actually can be broken down. So more like organic polymers and what's not, their polymers are sort of like this. So since you're forming water, these compounds, if you mix them with water and acid, like fairly strong acid, you can actually break them down, which this is why biological polymers are this way because nature doesn't make things that they can get rid of. Like nature makes things that you can recycle. So when we make proteins, when we make anything, the body makes sure that when they make these things or organisms make sure that when they make these things, they can actually use them back and break them down to use them again. So they're sustainable things. So these are the two main types of polymers. So addition polymers, they're all synthetic, like we made them in the labs. Condensation polymers are a mixture of both. Like as an example, polyester is not something like nature makes, we make polyester. A uh, nylon is also a synthetic polymer. Um, there's a condensation polymer and so on. So those are the two main types of polymers. So we are talking about different biological polymers. And one of them were like proteins. Um, so proteins are made of amino acids. And something you need to know is like, you need to be able to recognize the different molecules. So to recognize a protein, you basically need to recognize amino acids. If you know that you have a bunch of amino acids combined, then you know you have a protein. Um, amino acids, if you, as you learn functional groups, you should be able to know some of the components of amino acids. So amino acids need to have an amino group, which we know is an NH2 group. And we also have an acid group and in organic chemistry, we only know one acid, which is the carboxylic acid. Which is COOH. So if a compound has basically these two groups separate, separated by one carbon, that is what we call an amino acid. So we will have, I'm gonna write H2N, then carbon, then C, O, O, H, that is an amino acid. You have, this carbon is four bonds. So one of them is going to be an H and the next one will be an R. And R means anything. In nature, we have 20 like normal amino acids. There's some of the random ones that some organisms make. But like for humans, we use like 20 amino acids. And they all have this formula. They have an amino group attached to a carbon that is attached to a carboxylic acid. And then that C is attached to one hydrogen and then a bunch of different things. If it's a hydrogen, they call it alanine. If it's a methyl, it's like glycine and so on. There's different names. Um, you don't need to know them. You just need to know that they're, they're 20. And you need to know that there's some of them, I think there are six, it could be seven, uh, essential amino acids. And an essential amino acid is an amino acid that your body cannot make. So it's like, essential doesn't mean that you need it. You literally need all of them. If you don't have one of them, you, you wouldn't be able to form the proteins you need to survive. But there's some of them that, that are essential. It means that your body cannot make, them, cannot make them, which means that you have to ingest it. So you have to eat food to get it. Most of the amino acids or most of the proteins that we get is from meat. So that's why if you're a vegetarian 
or a vegan, you need to make sure you are eating the right uh, food so you can get the amino acids that are essential because you need that those specific amino acids. And the easiest way to get them is just through meat. Like it's not the only way. And it's not you can eat whatever you want. You just need to make sure that you're just getting those nutrients from somewhere else. Somewhere else. So when you combine amino acids, they basically the amino group combines with the carboxylic acid. So you're gonna have an NH2 trying to combine with a H O C double bond like that. So you have one amino acid in one side and another amino acid on the other side and the opposite side of each other, they connect. The way they connect is the OH takes one of the H's from the NH2 and forms H2O and then the NH combines with the O C like that. So you basically took an amine group and a carboxylic acid acid group and you form this group, which hopefully you guys remember is called an amide and water. Good. So that's how you the polymers or the proteins are formed. Um, this amide bond, we call it a peptide bond. So you will see questions that ask you like, what type of bond links uh, amino acids together? And that is a peptide bond, which is also known as an amide bond. The peptide bond, this is the common name, but it's actually an amide bond. So for the most part, um, all you need to know about proteins, there is like an extra question that has nothing to do with structure, but it has to do with protein folding. So basically the amino acids combine and they get these long strings of amino acids, which is what we call a polypeptide or a protein. So a polypeptide is a polymer of peptide bonds. Um, and then they like go in water and they get into shape and then they have function. And the, that process of like combining things and getting up to the point where the protein has a function is what we call protein folding. And this has four steps. Um, the first one is um, the sequence of amino acids. So basically just linking all the amino acids together, that's the first step in protein folding. Then the second step in protein, fold, in, in protein folding, I'm gonna actually call it like, oh, sorry. <laughs> Intermolecular interactions. which is like hydrogen bonding between amino acids. So the first thing that happens with the protein is being folded. The first one is like these, all the amino acids combine. And then when they're all next to each other, they start interacting with each other. So they start doing double bonds, sorry, hydrogen bonds and so on. Then the third step that's going to happen is like they're going to form covalent bonds. And they're called the disulfide bonds. So then like the sulfurs will actually start forming like uh, real bonds, not hydrogen bonding, but like bonds are covalent. So they're going to be strong and they're going to hold that structure like strongly, it's just like a really good foundation. And then the fourth step, and this is, I'm gonna write optional. Uh, re the reason I write optional is because not all proteins do this. Uh, uh, more than one peptide 
or poly peptide combined. So sometimes you get like, so two different molecules, like they polymerize, they form hydrogen bonding, they form disulfide bonds, and then they combine. So you get like two different ones. Some, an example of that would be like hemoglobin. So it's what we use in our blood to carry oxygen. It's actually four different proteins into one big protein. Um, if you take this in biology, the steps of protein folding, they'll call these like um, structures. So this will be like the primary structure. This will be the secondary. Uh, this will be the tertiary. And that will be the quaternary structure. So today biology, they will do this in terms of structures. So <laughs> that's about proteins. We saw the hardest ones. Um, the second one is sugars or carbohydrates. So the way to recognize an amino acid is because they have the amino group and the acid group or the carboxylic acid. The way to recognize sugars is because they have the same number of carbons and oxygens. But that's sort of like the key. You see a molecule that has like seven carbons, seven oxygens, you know it's most likely gonna be a sugar. Um, we normally write the formula, right, general formula. Um, chemists would write it as CNH, 2N plus two, um, O N. Biology writes C H two O N. So in general, basically telling you like you had twice as many hydrogens as you have carbons, yet you had the same number of oxygen as you have carbons. I don't like the biology one because the biology one sort of implies that you got some water molecules, but you really don't. Um, most of these molecules are either gonna be cyclic or linear. So you can have them sort of looking like this. And then each carbon, this carbon has this oxygen and this carbon will have like another oxygen and this one will have another oxygen and another oxygen. And this one will have like another oxygen. So something like that. But sometimes they can, they, these things can also be drawn And it's not the exact molecule, but it could also be drawn this way. So you just have like, there's the number of oxygens and carbons and then put one extra oxygen in here. But you can see them either way. And you just need to be able to recognize that they are sugar molecules because they have the same number of oxygens that they have, that they have on carbon. In these molecules, what they have is a bunch of hydroxides. So they have like a molecule and an OH, and then you have another molecule and you have OH. So when they combine as all these other molecules, one OH takes the H and then it forms H2O. And then the rest of the molecule combines and you now ended up having, in this case, an ether because the OH from the other, other molecule left. So most of the sugar are gonna be just bonded together by eaters. So you use a bunch of eaters. Um, and they are called in biology a glycosidic bond. It's just basically two alcohols combined together forming an eater and releasing water. And that's what you need to know about sugars. There's a few sugar molecules on the notes, so you can look at them and see how they look like. Um, actually, I can pick one.
not great resolution, but from here we can see how we have this carbon here attached to an oxygen, attached to another carbon. So they're all with ether bonds. And we also see how they all have this like cyclic form. So that's sort of how they look like. Then we talk about proteins and carbohydrates. Then the next one will be nucleic acids. And these are DNA and RNA. So these ones to recognize them is the way to recognize them is like knowing that they're really, really weird looking. Each uh, nucleic acid is made of nucleotides. And each nucleotide, nucleotide has three components. So they have a phosphate group. And this will be just a good way to recognize them because we haven't seen phosphates yet. So this is the only group that actually has phosphates. They also have a sugar and they have a nitrogenous base. Nitrogenous base is just a molecule with a bunch of phosphates, sorry, a bunch of nit nitrogens. Um, so the phosphate group could be either one, two, or three phosphates. I'm just gonna write one just to keep things simple. Um, then it's gonna be connected to a sugar. The sugar is a pentose, which means it has five carbon sugar. And it sort of looks like that. As we know, sugars have the same number of oxygens as carbon. So this carbon has an oxygen. This carbon will have something. This one will have something. This one will have something. Actually, this one is actually the one that is attached to that one right there. And then this one has something. So that each carbon has an oxygen. Then this oxygen here leaves to form that N here. And I'm gonna just put a cloud with a bunch of Ns because they are different ones and they're just molecules with a bunch of nitrogens. So this is how all, I mean, nucleotides for nucleic acids look like. So we said that there is a difference between DNA. The two different ones are DNA and RNA. RNA, R is ribose. And DNA is deoxyribose. Good. So the difference between the two is just one oxygen. That's basically the only difference between the two different molecules. So this oxygen here is present in RNA, but it's not present in DNA. So the deoxy means missing the oxygen. So it's missing that oxygen here. So if you wanna recognize DNA or RNA, you just need to look at the sugar and look here to see whether there's an oxygen there or not. Good? The way these compounds connect is sort of weird. So I'm not gonna tell you the mechanism, I'm just gonna draw it. So they basically connect with like the oxygen here connects, let me use a different color. This oxygen here connects with the oxygen here. So they have this like, you have one sugar here with my nitrogen space. And then I'm actually gonna, use DNA, so then we got the P, and then we got the O, then another O, another O, then that connects, sorry, it's not this one, it connects here. So then the second one would be here. Thank you. 
And that's how they look like. So they connect so like this way. And this is what they call the DNA or the RNA backbone. Um, so we always talk about the bond that connects the two molecules for amino acids was a peptide bond, for sugars was a glycosidic bond. So the peptide is an amide, the sugar is an ether. And then this one is weird because we don't know many functional groups that have the P. So what I'm going to do is let's, let's assume that this is a C. If that is a C and I cut it in half, this looks like an ester. It's like a carbon that went into oxygen there. And then if you look at the bottom part, that also looks like an ester. So I could call that a diester. It's like two esters in one thing. Then this is not a carbon, this is actually a phosphorus. So I'm gonna call it a phospho diester. And that is actually the name of that bond. It's called a phosphodiester bond. So what keeps amino acids together is a phosphodiester bond. <laughs> Then <laughs> the last category <coughs> are actually fats. Fats, I'll leave it to the end because they're like super weird. Um, they're also called lipids. And they're like a bunch of different ones. So for this part, I just wanna tell you the main three categories that you can see. Um, so you can see triglycerides. And triglycerides have the tribe, which means three. Um, we can have fatty acids. And we can have steroids. So I just want to tell you how to recognize them. You're not going to talk about bonding or anything like that. So triglycerides are actually going to look like this. They have three chains with like a bunch of carbons. So they have like a change. This in ending is a carbon. So three carbons and three oxygens. It's called glycerol. Um, and it connects with three compounds are like a, like a carbon chain with a carboxylic acid. In this case, you form an ester. So triglycerides look like that. Um, we can always Go here and be like, let's see how triglycerides look. So this is just an example. So you see they have like those carbons with the oxygens, then we have the carboxylic acids that actually from the ester and just a bunch of carbons. I just make the wiggly tails because it's different triglycerides have different carbons. Good. Um, <coughs> fatty acid is just basically one chain Like example, like one of these change is basically a fatty acid. And the fatty acids can be broken down in two categories, can be saturated, which is the example I drew. And saturated means it doesn't have any double, triple bonds, which means it's saturated with HS. That's as many HS as it, as it could potentially have. And then you can have unsaturated, which would be when you start getting double bonds. You can have one, you can have two, you can have three, you can have many double bonds. And that's what we call the unsaturated ones. The unsaturated ones um, are better healthy, like health speaking than, uns than saturated because the unsaturated have double bonds so we can break them down easy. They, are, they have functional groups, so they're functional. So we can break them. Um, we think this unsaturated ones, we have the cis and we have the trans. And we never talk about the cis, we always talk about the trans because like, if you look at foods, like especially like foods that you buy from the vending machine, they're like zero trans fat. Like they say that a lot. 
So a trans fat would look like this. And a cis fat be one, two, three, four. So one, two, three, four. The cis fat would look like that. So as you can see, this one looks like linear and this one is not linear. And this is important because this one stack, so they become like butter. It's like a fat that just becomes really thick and then it gets stuck, it gets stuck in your blood vessel. So your blood cannot flow. The cis is like kinks. Like the cis just has these kinks that they just can't really stack. So then they become fluid. So then it goes through your body and you can get rid of it a lot easier. So it's like having bacon fat versus having just like oil fat. And steroids, they're really weird, but that, the good things like that really weird, so they're really easy to recognize. They look like, this with bunch of decorations it's just like these fuse rings so when i call it fuse rings and for these things is for, for the questions from the quiz and the final i just want to give you a bunch of different or not like in this section i just going to give you different compounds or different structures and you have to recognize what they are so i'm trying to give you like the hints of how to recognize one over the other so let's look at steroids Let's see how they look like uh, <laughs> uh, chemical formula chemical structure works too so you see they're all like these all these fuse rings so i made a pentagon in the first one and some of them have pentagons i guess most of them have hexagons but it's all like that and this is how you make them so to make steroids like if you look at testosterone versus you look at estrogen, they all have this general formula. All your steroids, hormones, they're all made of this. Cholesterol, see um, how all these things look like. So those are the main categories of biopolymers and how to recognize them.